Before we discuss the fate of Brandenburg Prussia during the Thirty Years' War, it is important that we have an overview of the conflict in general. The Thirty Years' War, 1618-1648, would mark itself as one of the most deadly, long, and brutal conflicts in European history. Involving nearly all of the major powers in Europe, as well as countless smaller ones, the three decades would fundamentally transform the fabric of Europe arguably more than the Reformation had a century earlier. Starting as a relatively small revolt by Bohemian Protestants against the increasingly anti-Protestant policies in the Holy Roman Empire, the war would escalate to encompass virtually all of the continent. When the conflict finally ended in 1648, millions lay dead, the power of the Holy Roman Empire was shattered, Germany would remain disunified until the 19th century, and France would become the dominant power of Europe for the next 200 years. Officially, the war itself began in May of 1618. While the Peace of Augsburg in 1555 had managed to see relative stability and peace within the empire by allowing for religious freedom of its Lutheran and Catholic subjects, relations within the empire were becoming increasingly strained, and while Augsburg provided for toleration of Lutheranism, it did not apply to Calvinism, which had established itself as the dominant religion in a number of German states, such as the Palatinate at Brandenburg. Furthermore, after the Council of Trent, the Catholic Counter-Reformation and increasingly anti-Protestant policies of the Habsburg emperors were raising fears among Protestants of coming Catholic persecution. The start of the conflict came with the demonstration of Prague when Protestant Bohemians threw officials of Emperor Ferdinand II out a window. The conflict quickly spread across Europe involving most of its major powers. While the war and the events leading up to it were dominated by religious discontent within the empire, the conflict would come to be a largely political power struggle by the major powers of Europe, exploiting the collapse of the empire. Roughly, the conflict would involve on the Protestant side, Sweden, Denmark, Protestant German states, Brandenburg, the Netherlands, England, Scotland, and France, and various Protestant rebels along with Russian and Ottoman support. And on the Catholic side, Habsburg Austria, Spain, the Catholic German states, and support from Poland. Escalation of the conflict can broadly be divided into four phases. The initial Bohemian Revolt, 1618 to 1625, the Danish phase, 1625 to 1629, the Swedish phase, 1630 to 1635, and the French intervention, 1635 to 1648. Outside of the direct conflict in Germany between Protestant and Catholic powers, the war also involved the Dutch War of Independence from Spain and the intervention of Catholic France on the side of the Protestant forces for fear of encirclement by a strengthened Spain and Holy Roman Empire. The balance of power during the war shifted constantly following the outcome of major battles, deaths of leaders, and the entrance and withdrawal of new powers into and out of the war. The conflict finally ended in 1648 with the signing of the Treaties of Münster and Osnabrück between the major powers of Sweden, the Holy Roman Empire, the Netherlands, France, and Spain. The general result of what would become known as the Peace of Westphalia were thus. The Dutch Republic secured its independence from Spain, the Protestant German states were allowed to maintain their religion, Calvinism was formally recognized within the empire, Christians in Germany were granted full freedom of worship regardless of their state's official religion, the Palatinate was divided up, the emperor lost the political control seized during the war and power returned to the imperial states, Switzerland became independent of the empire, Sweden secured West Pomerania and various Baltic territories in Germany as well as a vote in the imperial diet, and Brandenburg gained East Pomerania, or Hinterpommern, Minden, Kamen, Magdeburg, and Halberstadt. The deeper implications of the war and resulting Peace of Westphalia would have a resounding impact throughout European history in the centuries to come. The conflict, initially seen as an attempt by the Catholic powers of Spain and Austria to curtail Protestantism, had catastrophically backfired. Not only were the Protestant German states able to maintain their beliefs, but with increased religious toleration, Catholic influence over the empire further waned. Even more devastating was that the political influence of the Catholic Church began a terminal decline in Europe following the war as the Church had both utterly failed to rein in the Protestants but had shown itself to be a detriment to the national ambitions of nation-states like France. Furthermore, the Holy Roman Empire ceased to be a political entity as any unity it still possessed was shattered. Instead, Germany would now consist of many, many small states whose independence and allegiance depended on the ambitions and strength of emerging German power such as Saxony, Bavaria, and Brandenburg, and outside countries such as the coming Polish Commonwealth and France and Sweden. Lastly, the war had propelled France into becoming the dominant power in Europe, 
Not only had they greatly profited in their efforts in the war, but they had achieved a level of unity and centralization under King Louis XIV and Cardinal Richelieu, allowing them to more efficiently manage their natural resources. This combined with the end of the Holy Roman Empire as a coherent political entity and the stagnation of Spain would place France, not Germany or Spain, as the political and cultural center of Europe for the next 200 years. Of course, the war had not only weakened the empire politically, but the decades of conflict had devastated Germany. Rough estimates placed the death toll of the war at 8 million people. In contrast, the death toll of World War I was around 11 million, but if one adjusts for population growth, then in 1914 numbers, the Thirty Years' War would have killed roughly 20 million people, and in today's numbers, 35 million people. As we discussed in the last episode, by 1618, Brandenburg had greatly benefited, at least on paper, from two centuries of Hohenzollern rule. Its territory had greatly expanded in size after acquiring Ducal Prussia, Cleves, Ravensburg, and Mark, it had adopted the new Protestant faith while maintaining amicable relations with the emperor, and through its new territories had secured access to both the sea and to fertile farmland and iron deposits in the west. However, it is quite evident that the state of Brandenburg and its rulers were wholly unprepared for the war. Still lacking in natural defensible boundaries, the vulnerability was further exacerbated by the fact that Brandenburg now possessed several distant and separate territories, Relations with other Protestant powers were strained after the conversion of the elector to Calvinism. Further troubling to the electors was the still defined and fickle relations with the estates, the bodies of nobility, clergy, and burghers who still maintained power to levy taxes. And worst of all, of course, is the lack of a proper military. As Christopher Clark states in Iron Kingdom, quote, the Empire's military establishment was based on an archaic system of feudal levies that had been in sharp decline for over a century by 1600. There was no standing army beyond a few companies of lifeguards and some insignificant fortress garrisons." Unquote. In short, the incredible fragility of Brandenburg's military and diplomatic position was already such that it would stand little chance of successfully defending its territory against invasion or incursion under normal circumstances. Even worse for the Hohenzollern state was that not only would they be subject to repeated foreign occupation in the coming war, but that Brandenburg itself and the surrounding area would be at the center of much of the fighting between two of the major powers, Sweden and Habsburg Austria. Over the next 30 years, the Hohenzollerns were all but utterly helpless as they watched their lands become the site of bloody battles, military occupation, rape, looting, torture, and all manner of horrific acts inflicted by the armies on the civilian population. For the apparatus of state, however, Brandenburg and its elector, the incompetent and ineffective and cowardly George William, 1619 to 1640, would desperately try and navigate alliances between the major powers in the hopes of being spared the brutality of the war. Of course, this backfired as the balance of power was often in flux and Brandenburg was effectively at the mercy of its occupiers, be they imperial or Swedish. The early years of the war for Brandenburg were ones of tenuous neutrality and indecisiveness. Elector George William, weak and timid as he was, understood the reality that his country lacked any substantial military resources, and so the best policy would be one of neutrality. While morally in support of the Protestant cause, Brandenburg did not intervene when the conflict began to escalate, and Protestant forces marched east to face the Habsburgs. Reluctance to commit to a fight came not only from the elector, but from his estates as well, who were distrustful of their Calvinist ruler and still loyal to the emperor, and so they were unlikely to provide him with the money and resources for a war. This policy of neutrality lasted eight years until the Protestant commander Manfeld and the Danish army marched into the Altmark in 1626, and with them came, as with most armies at the time, looting, extortion, rape, torture, and the destruction of property. No sooner had the Danish come to Brandenburg when they were expunged by the Imperial Army after their defeat at Lutter am Barensburg in August. Now the rampaging armies bore Imperial standards instead of Danish ones. Meanwhile, King Gustavus Adolphus of Sweden seized Ducal Prussia as a base of operations to the understandable but useless protest of the Elector. In May of 1626, George William threw his lot in with the Emperor opening his territory to the imperial troops. This decision, instead of securing peace and stability for Brandenburg, backfired as the emperor's intentions were far more harsh than anticipated. Under the Edict of Restitution in 1629, the emperor proposed to roll back the religious protections of Augsburg. Even worse, the imperial forces led by Count von Fallenstein had the habit of procuring wealth, lodging, and food from the local area, which meant more looting and pillaging. And lastly, with the entrance of Sweden into the war in 1630, this opened Brandenburg up to retribution by the Protestant powers. 
It also happened that George William was the brother-in-law of the King of Sweden, the mighty and zealous Gustavus Adolphus, who had married his sister Maria Eleonora. The Swedes would seek out an alliance with Brandenburg and the other Protestant states in an effort to consolidate the Protestant cause against the Emperor. After several victories against Imperial forces in Brandenburg, Sweden sought to persuade the country into alliance, and as their king, Gustavus Adolphus, said, quote, I don't want to know or hear anything about neutrality. The elector has to be friend or foe. When I come to his borders, he must declare himself cold or warm. This is a fight between God and the devil. If my cousin wants to be on the side of God, then he has to join me. If he prefers to side with the devil, then indeed he must fight me. There is no third way." Unquote. After the encroachment of the Swedish army on Berlin, and even the Swedes training their guns on the elector's palace, a treaty was finally signed allying Brandenburg to Sweden. Brandenburg would likely fare better under the auspices of Sweden than the emperor. There was even talk of partitioning Pomerania and giving a peace to Brandenburg, giving it access to the sea. In addition, in the aftermath of the sacking of Magdeburg by the imperial commander Count von Tilly in 1631, one of the most infamous incidences of the war, it made the Swedes a far more appealing partner, in addition to their guns trained on the palace. Of course, in the end, George William had no say in the matter. They would either be friends or enemies of Sweden. Of course, as luck would have it, the alliance with Sweden would be short-lived with the death of Gustavus Adolphus in 1632 and the defeat of the Swedish army at Nordlingen in 1634. Following the defeat of Sweden, Brandenburg realigned itself with the emperor, and after offering more moderate terms, George William came back to the imperial cause with the Peace of Prague in 1635. A contingent of imperial troops would be sent to Brandenburg to drive out the Swedes. The claim on Pomerania would be honored, but there was still no guarantee of the toleration of Calvinism. In any case, while George attempted to raise an army of his own, it turned out to be a poorly equipped and undisciplined force. The balance of power shifted yet again as the Swedes defeated the Saxon army at Wittstock on October 4, 1636, and overran Brandenburg once again. After a brief attempt to fend the Swedes off with his feeble army and secure Pomerania in 1637, the elector fled to the safety of Ducal Prussia, where he would spend the rest of his life, dying in 1640, leaving his country to the mercy, of which there was very little, of the imperial and Swedish armies. While George William likely comes across as a cowardly, indecisive fool, one cannot place all the blame for Brandenburg's fate on him. The situation he found himself in was one that even the greatest military and political leaders would find almost impossible to successfully guide Brandenburg through this catastrophic period. What good would a military genius be if there was no army? What good would a master diplomat be when his actions could not be backed up by force? The bleak situation, however, was at least somewhat managed by a most controversial and unlikely figure, the Catholic Count Adam von Schwarzenberg, who would intermittently lead the government in Berlin throughout the war owing to his unpopularity with Protestant members of the Privy Council. However, by the 1630s, Schwarzenberg seemed to be the only man in Brandenburg capable of making use of the situation. The war had left the provincial estates incredibly weak and able to be brought to full heel into relegating taxation powers to the central government. Harsh taxes were raised and central power consolidated. Following the flight of the elector to Ducal Prussia in 1637, Schwarzenberg was the de facto leader of Brandenburg, ruling effectively as a military dictator. Despised as he was by many for being a ruthless foreign Catholic, Schwarzenberg set a number of precedents that would eventually translate into the centralized bureaucracy with a penchant for efficiency that the Prussians became renowned for. After Westphalia, Brandenburg once again seemed on paper to have gained from the war. It lost no territory, and with the addition of East Pomerania and other territories, Brandenburg proper gained access to the sea, and now in size rivaled other large German states like Bavaria and Saxony. Of course, it is important not to overplay the efforts made by the Brandenburg government, as the country was still subject to an unimaginable level of devastation. Looking at sheer population loss alone, the numbers are staggering. By the early 1650s, it's recorded that anywhere from 15 to 85 percent of farmsteads lay abandoned, and all across Brandenburg and Germany, thousands and towns of villages lay completely desolate, their inhabitants wiped out either by rampaging armies, starvation, or disease. It was said that no one remained who could remember what things were like before the Swedes came. Even much of Brandenburg's folk culture had been lost due to the horrendous civilian casualties. So what is one to make of all of this? How did a relatively small religious conflict escalate so quickly and become so utterly devastating? What leads men to commit such unimaginable atrocities? Looting, while certainly not admirable, is understandable, and even rape, as horrible as it is, 
has a rational basis considering that most of these men had been spending months, if not years, away from their wives if they had married at all yet. But what seems incomprehensible is the irrational bloodlust, the torture and murder of children, the unapologetic cruelty which yielded no material reward. Such thoughts likely fill the mind of Thomas Hobbes, whose native England, though separated by sea from the continent, did not escape much of the violence and unrest. In short, his philosophy, laid out in works such as Leviathan, understood mankind not to be born inherently good, as later French philosophers such as Rousseau would claim. Instead, mankind was inclined towards cruelty and malice, malice that was on full display during the Thirty Years' War. The only way, the best way Hobbes believed to reduce suffering and avoid throwing society into the chaotic abyss, was to have a very strong, authoritarian central state to keep mankind's savagery in check. The Prussians would become well known for three things, a second-to-none army, an efficient bureaucracy, and a strict moral code. And I think the seeds for these three pillars of Prussian society were sown during the war. The utter devastation visited upon Prussia was something that future rulers were adamant to ensure would never happen again. Thus, a strong emphasis on producing a powerful military force to protect the nation externally was ingrained into the Prussian government. But reform internally was needed as well, as many of the atrocities were committed by Brandenburg's soldiers against their own people. And I think it was here that the desire for a strict code of ethics came about as a way to combat the violent outbursts that seemed so prevalent in mankind. With how much destruction the Prussians suffered during the Thirty Years' War, one can begin to understand how the stereotype of the puritanical, military and order-obsessed Prussian came about. Prussia needed soldiers, it needed disciplined, restrained men to stand against the tide of chaos. And although failing in the end, Prussia managed to defy all odds for centuries and not just recover from the war, but survive and thrive and grow and grow, defeat its enemies, and eventually come to bring Germany together. Though none of this would have been achieved without the substantial groundwork laid during the recovery by the Great Elector. Es izgāju prūšu zemi, ko klēdāmi spēlēdāmi. Es izgāju prūšu zemi, ko klēdāmi spēlēdāmi. Prūšu meitās man gribējās, Are you cool? 